you the agenda and the speaker bios for you. Thank you. Good memory. And thank you all for being here and helping us to get the word out about this really important topic. And thank you also um, to our colleagues at NRDC and to the Ethical Culture Society of New York. Um, I wanted to make a comment related to an environmental justice contention that Clearwater filed um, in the relicensing of Indian Point. And I want to point out that the economic dangers that were brought out in the morning panel will disproportionately impact uh, communities of color and low income that have already been disproportionately impacted. And uh, what the NRC said about Clearwater's contention was that we did such a good job in filling the void in the public knowledge that neither NRC nor Entergy needed to revise a very shoddy um, environmental justice uh, assessment that they had included in their application. Um, so we're here this afternoon to focus a little bit more. Um, uh, John Cyphos from the Attorney General's office gave us an introduction to how this impacts uh, New York, but we're going to be talking a little bit about New York and about some of the other facilities that have been decom or not decommissioned, but have closed, and uh, what is being discussed about their decommissioning. So I'd like to uh, start initially um, by introducing Deb Katz, the Executive Director of Citizens Awareness Network. Uh, who will be talking about the deregulation of decommission. Let me say that I am going to start with a cautionary tale. In, in comparison to the discussion in a certain way that took place this morning. So I live in an impacted community. I live four miles from the decommissioned Yankee well reactor and 16 miles from the Vermont Yankee reactor, which is closed and in the process of cleanup. Basically, I live between two high-level waste dumps with millions of curies of high-level waste and with no solution to deal with that waste. This is not the issue today, but it is an issue that sits in the middle of decommissioning. What I want to start with in this cautionary tale is to say there are no good solutions to nuclear power. There are only worse solutions and better than worse solutions. But there is never a good solution. So we were involved in the closure of Yankee Row and also with Connecticut Yankee. We have intervened in both the decommissioning of Yankee Row and Connecticut Yankee. We won a lawsuit against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in terms of the illegal decommissioning of Yankee Row. We have also consulted with the state of Vermont in terms of their just transition plan to close Vermont Yankee and also on decommissioning issues and the creation of a citizens advisory panel that provides at least some transparency to the process of decommissioning and it is run by the state. So let me go to Roe, because Roe began a rapid dismantlement, and of course, like every community, there was a wish that that waste would leave immediately. But in fact, as we watched this process take place, what we saw was a very, what we experienced as dangerous situation in which the 
Corporation is releasing, continuing to release radioactive waste into our local river. Our kids use that river. We have, in fact, an epidemic of disease in our community. So the idea of their continuing to dump radioactive waste routinely in the river during decommissioning was unacceptable to us. They were also moving large components filled with concrete down our roads and, you know, down to railways. These were hot. They were not radiation free. And this was also a concern to us. They were actually trucks that were sitting with radioactive waste basically idling in the town of Reedsboro. There was radioactive waste that was being taken off site and given in Connecticut, Yankee, there were, um, what do you call it, bricks given to a daycare center. In Rome, there were, you know, um, embankments given to the, t the time of Monroe. All of this is the loss of radiological control, and this is part of decommissioning. We took the NRC to court over all of this and the rapid dismantlement, which we are not in agreement with is the best way to deal with decommissioning, and I will deal with that in a minute. And we, in district court, the Judge Ponser said that it reminded him of the Office of Circumlocution in Bleak House are trying to get a process in which we had some say. And he said, if this process is used by the NRC regularly in matters that vitally affect communities, it's unacceptable. But he couldn't stop them, and he sent us to appellate court in Boston, First Circuit, in which at this point, of course, Yankee Atomic is stripping and shipping the reactor, and we're going to court. But in fact, the NRC was found to be outside of the law, and they were found to be in violation of the National Environmental Policy Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Atomic Energy Act. This was a pure victory. We also went to the Office of Inspector General for the NRC and asked them to analyze and investigate how the NRC could do this. And they came back with a report which was called NRC at the Crossroads, which was about whether NRC was going to maintain strict standards over decommissioning in terms of remaining a major federal action in which the public as well as states could participate in a meaningful way, not that you always win that, but there was a process, and where there was strict oversight. And the OIG's report basically stated that this crossroads meant that there was the potential for serious deregulation. And which way do you think the NRC went? Come on, someone can tell me which way they went. They went for deregulation. And what does that look like, you see? Because we're talking about, you know, in the abstract, everything sounds really groovy. What it meant was instead of submitting 300-page documents in which they had to put in commitments that they had to meet, and you could question whether they could meet them and how they could meet them, NRC only had to submit a 30-page document. Uh, not the NRC. The corporations only had to submit a 30-page document to strip and ship a reactor. 30-page document. There is no on-site resident inspector anymore. There are no longer hearings. I mean, the NRC periodically shows up, but this is all corporate driven now. There are no real meaningful hearings available anymore. There's no cross-examination. There isn't the ability for states or citizens to hold the corporation or the NRC accountable. And this is really, that's why it's a cautionary tale, because here are these states, and we've worked with the state of Vermont on this, in which they're realizing as they go through the process that, in fact, they have no power. It's sort of amazing to watch, because I know I have no power. I'm like a peon dealing with the NRC all the time. But the states are realizing they have been eviscerated in the process. And in fact, the NRC's regulation eviscerates itself. 
So it doesn't have power to really enforce what's going on. Now, I want to give you a sense of the colossal failure of nuclear power, which is shown in terms of cleanup, because all decommissioning funds, for the most part, in America are underfunded, and the NRC allows corporations to get away with it. They allow not just utilities, because with utilities, they feel the, the money will be made up. You know, on our backs, rate pay. We'll just pay more. So in that example, Yankee Rail cost $39 million to build, 1961, it's true. It cost over $700 million to clean up. It was one of the best-run reactors in America, and that is not including basically dry-casking the high-level waste. This is just cleanup. In Connecticut Yankee, it was supposed to cost about $800 million. It cost over $1.2 billion. And Connecticut Power and Light, ratepayers, they decommissioned in 1998, I think. Ratepayers were paying till this year to clean that site up, receiving no benefits, no power anymore, but having to pay. This is, this is unconscionable, what's going on. And now you get to merchant plants, and then we get to Entergy, right? And there's Entergy, and they don't have a rate base to go back to. So they're sitting there, and the negotiations that went on were about, well, the high-level waste has to get out of the fuel pool. It has to go into dry cast storage. There is no other way to deal with it. In fact, in Vermont Yankee, it's only a 100-acre site. There is no way to even harden it. It's impossible. There is no room at that site, but the waste has to come out. You've got to understand that right across the street from Vermont Yankee is an elementary school. I know none of you can believe that that's true, that anyone in their right mind would put an elementary school across from a high-level waste dump. But it is. We have asked that Entergy actually relocate the children during this period of time of moving the waste, not ending the emergency planning zone, because the high-level waste moving it is risky. And the NRC and Entergy, NC says, we don't have the money, and NRG says they don't have to do it. And in fact, what NRC is allowing Entergy to do, you have to understand, is that the decommissioning fund, which is just for radiological cleanup, that's all it's for. It's not for the chemical cleanup. You've got to understand, at Yankee Row, there were areas of contamination that went down 300 feet in terms of tritium. Guess how far Entergy wants to go to clean up the site? Oh, that's really too generous. <laughs> too generous. Too generous. Three. Just about three. That's what they want to do. And what do you think they're going to find? Nothing. And, and then they won't have to clean it up. But then what you have is a completely contaminated site. And you have to understand this notion as well of, you know, the 25 millirem, that cleanup standards in another number of states, including Vermont, Massachusetts, um, Maine had it. They have stricter standards than the NRC standards. But the NRC standard, they this notion of something being there on the 25 millirem, their average person is a 250-pound adult male. No women, no children, no pregnant women, no one else. And on that basis, they release the site. So the notion, these fantasies of an analysis of how things can happen and how it can look good are just that. They have little to do with reality. We do not believe that rapid dismantlement is necessarily the answer. And I'm in an impacted community. I should be a person that wants that waste moved, and I do. But let me tell you, the issues of um, environmental racism that is going on in terms of nuclear waste is unconscionable and immoral. And if we don't actually address it, we can't get anywhere. Because Barnwell, where the waste from Roe went, you've got to understand in the papers in South Carolina, Yankee Roe was looked at as a carpetbagger coming down, using the state of South Carolina as a nuclear toilet. Barnwell is a 46% African American community. Poor rural. It, 
is unacceptable what goes on in terms of nuclear waste. And so the notion of just being able to ship it to Andrews, which is also a poor rural community, or Sierra Blanca, where they wanted to ship it before that, which is a, a, a Hispanic community that has an average income of $7,000. Communities should not have to choose between health and safety and jobs. They shouldn't have to choose between having radioactive waste contamination and dumping it on someone else. These are unconscionable moral issues that have to be addressed in terms of looking at decommissioning. So what we advocate, and this is hard, with all the waste around me, we advocate that the fuel has to be moved from the fuel pool right away in the first couple of years, especially from the Mark I reactors, because the Mark I reactors have their fuel located outside of containment, seven stories in the air. I wonder who came up with that idea. <laughs> We need that waste moved because it's too dangerous sitting in the pool. But we believe that they have to wait eight or ten years to decommission because, one, it lowers worker exposure. And the workers at Roe and, in fact, at, at Connecticut Yankee were exposed. There was a confirmatory action letter sent on Connecticut Yankee. What is that? They wound up having to stop all decommissioning activities because workers were exposed to hot particles going through the fuel transfer area. And they weren't wearing masks, and they didn't have badges on. This is without regulation, you see. This is the issue of deregulation that's going on at this point. We believe that there, the institutional memory of the workers is essential, but that doesn't mean everything has to take place right away. We think it needs to wait eight to ten years. At row, they shipped 140 thousand curies to Barnwell, South Carolina. If they had waited 30 years, and that's not fully what we're advocating for, it would have been 14,000. It's a big difference. It's a big difference in terms of that community and our community. And what has to happen now is that states, as well as citizens, before the reacts are closed, and this I am in agreement with with the panel, have to begin working on these issues, addressing them with legislators, really dealing with the issues of states' rights. What was mentioned before about federalism in this situation is essential to address. The NRC says, well, yeah, you could, but they didn't choose rapid dismantlement, and they don't have to, so the states can't make them do it. You've got to understand the state has no power. That's why the state of Vermont has gone to court to try to get some power back. The state of Vermont cannot even know what energy is taking money out of the decommissioning fund for. It's all ratepayer money, and they want to pay the town taxes with ratepayer money. They want to pay for guarding the high level waste with ratepayer money. So I'm really sorry I can't bring you good news on deregulation, but the issue of states fighting this and taking NRC to court and creating accountability and a thorough and reasonable and moral decommissioning is essential to move forward in terms of closure. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Deb, for your direct experience. And also, uh, in order for us to move forward, we have to understand all of the elements. And with that, I'd like to bring up Tim Judson, who's the executive director of NIRS, which is the Nuclear Information Resource Service. Thank you, Tim. Great. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I should say in need of the full disclosure that, um, that I've been with NEARS for about two years, but in fact, you know, all of my ex previous experience working on nuclear issues was actually working with Deb, the Citizens Awareness Network, and, um, and I'm always, you know, it's always advantageous for me to go after Deb, uh, because, you know, I get to seem like the Pollyanna in the room. <laughs> um, 
But um, you know, I was asked to speak about uh, sort of you know the, the risks and opportunities for states and local communities with decommissioning. And I think you know, following Deb, I don't you know, there's a lot of the risks that I don't need to talk about. But the, but it really puts in sharp relief um, the you know really what the stakes are for states and local communities with the existing process um, and conditions of decommissioning uh, that we have today, uh, which is essentially I'm sorry, am I not loud enough? Yeah. Sure. How's that? Um, so, um, you know, what, what Deb just laid out is really, you know, what the stakes are um, for, you know, for, for, for local communities and, and the states that are going to ultimately end up liable for, uh, you know, for what are, you know, for, for these contaminated sites. And the notion that, uh, that, that, you know, the decommissioning and, and the remediation of the sites is going to return them to a greenfield state, uh, you know, where you know, things are going to be able to go back to, you know, the idyllic time before, before the reactor was there, it's really not the case. Um, and really what we're talking about is, you know, sort of being able to mitigate the risk to states and local communities of the aftermath of having these plants there. And how do we do that in the most responsible way possible? And I think what's clear, you know, from, from the, you know, you know, sort of having seen what decommissioning has been to this point, and then especially looking forward, which I'm going to talk about, is that what's really needed is a paradigm shift. Um, you know, in uh, you know, in, in you know, with respect to decommissioning as part of um, a broader transition strategy from the sort of the, the dirty energy sector that we have today um, to what's going to come after, which will hopefully be a clean energy sector. Um, but that said, I want to kind of refer back a little bit to the kind of the scale of the, the, the problem um, to kind of get at some of the some of the other elements of risk and opportunity that there are here. Um, so to refer back to, to Michael Schneider's present, brilliant presentation this morning, um, with more a more direct and specific look at the U.S., um, you know, we are potentially about to see essentially the floodgates of, of radioactive waste from decommissioning open up in this country, and the reason for that is really. Um, you know, that, that there is sort of a, you know, an economic phase out of nuclear power and on the verge of happening. And there's a question of whether uh, the industry through its, through its political influence is going to be able to, to defer and delay that, um, you know, through uh, essentially rigging energy policy to, you know, to, uh, to try to sustain nuclear power for as long as possible. That's sort of a separate topic that's, that's, gonna come, that's coming up right now as well. Um, but here's, here's essentially the trend that's happening. Um, as Michael mentioned, you know, the average age of a nuclear reactor in the U.S. is 35 years. Um, the, 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 the operating costs of reactors in the U.S. is increasing at a pretty phenomenal rate. Uh, since 2007-2008, the, the rate of, the, of cost increase in the U.S. Uh, has been about 5% or more a year on average. Um, some reactors are vastly exceeding that level of you know, their, 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 their basic operating costs going up. Um, but what that means is that you know for for you know for uh, the, the average operating cost of a nuke in the U.S. Um, is over forty-four dollars a megawatt hour, four point four cents a kilowatt hour. That's more than the cost of, of energy in, in you know in places of the country like upstate New York and, and most of New England. Um, but for you know but but there, it's not spread evenly. That that's really an average and. For single reactor plants, you know, like you have, at, you know, in, in uh, upstate New York with Guinea and Fitzpatrick with Pilgrim and Vermont Yankee, the average operating cost is over fifty dollars a megawatt hour, over five cents a kilowatt hour. And if you look at the way that the industry, those, those, the, the range of costs is spread out, twenty-five percent of the plants in the U.S. Um, have an operating cost over six cents a kilowatt hour, over sixty dollars a megawatt hour, which is above the you know the the, the wholesale price of electricity, basically anywhere you know um, in, in the country. And what that means is that especially for for plants that are not run by by utility companies, um, you know where they can where they're regulated by the state utility commissions and can recover their costs for continuing to operate them. Um, for, for what are called merchant reactors, like we have in the Northeast and most of the Midwest, uh, that means those plants have to basically, uh, you know, try to try to make a profit on whatever the price of electricity is on the wholesale market. That means for these plants that are operating at, you know, over six over six, sixty dollars a megawatt hour for their operating cost, there's they're literally hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging money, and um, and you know if, if this rate of and so that, what that means is that you know that that trend of rising operating costs has intersected with 
you know, what has really been sort of a precipitous decline in the cost of electricity since 2008. Um, and, those two, and those two trends have intersected in a way that's really putting the nuclear industry at sort of existential risk. And that's, that's what Michael Schneider's presentation is really showing. That means that right now, currently, there are, 12, there are at least 12 reactors in the U.S. that are in imminent risk of being closed just for basic economic reasons. And you saw the, the announcement about the Pilgrim reactor earlier this week. We're expecting the Fitzpatrick reactor announcement to come within a couple of weeks. Um, the Ganae reactor in upstate New York, there's five reactors in Illinois. Um, there's, you know, this is potentially a wave of reactor closures coming imminently. Um, and if this trend of rising costs and declining prices continues, by 2020, um, you would see about 50% of the U.S. reactor fleet become unprofitable. And um, that's, that's nearly 50 reactors across the country. There, there, could be, there, there could be the economic reason for them just to just shut down. Um, so that really is what kind of puts this issue of decommissioning in sharp relief. And believe me, there's people who, who you know, there's, there's, corpora you know there's, there's corporations who see this as an opportunity. The nuclear power industry sees it as a real threat. Um, but there's conferences happening like the one that Jeff Fettis mentioned before this morning um, about the opportunities in decommissioning. And what I think we're starting to see now is sort of a, what I kind of call a vulture industry, um, you know, beginning to form um, around the idea that there's billions and billions of dollars to be made in decommissioning nuclear power plants. And um, to some extent, if, if decommissioning work, you know, if reactor closures continue and decommissioning on sets, then yes, there's, there's clearly going to be um, a growth industry in dealing with this radioactive mess. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. Um, for instance, um, you know, with the, the fact that you know these merchant plants are the, are the most at risk of shutting down right now, um, the, you know the, the, those companies like Entergy um, are saying that the safe store, safe store is going to be their model for you know for, for decommissioning, which means that whatever opportunity there is, you know, whatever increase in decommissioning activity there is going to be, is going to be deferred for several decades. So in fact, you know, you know, the idea that there's going to be a, a boom in decommissioning business is actually not necessarily true. It could be delayed for a very long time. Um, there's also the issue of the way in which the, the well, one, of, one of the things that drives the cost of decommissioning is the fees for radioactive waste disposal. And those have also you know, traditionally increased at super, super inflationary rates. And if there's an onset of reactor decommissionings, um, the cost of waste disposal is inevitably going to go up pretty dramatically. And so that's going to, that, that has the potential to deplete the decommissioning funds that have been set aside um, at, a, at a more rapid rate, um, or to force the companies to defer decommissioning for, for longer periods of time. Um, so there's really you know, a question of you know, how, I mean, if, if things persist the way they are, um, the trend could be that, you know, that, um, you know, could be that, you know, the communities are saddled with the risk of radioactively contaminated nuclear plant sites um, for, for very long periods of time, or that the decommissioning funds are not going to be sufficient and potentially uh, that the companies that own the reactors are going to go bankrupt um, and then leave the states and the local communities with a real dilemma as to how these liabilities are going to be paid for. Um, this is something that, that really, you know, is going to be confronting, especially states like New York, where within a few years, potentially four of the state's six, six reactors could be shutting down, you know, by 2020, um, with Guinea, Fitzpatrick, and Indian Point Two and Three, um, and then you know, India, I mean, Nine Mile Point One, which is also you know another smaller reactor, um, is really probably one major safety issue away from being closed for economic reasons as well. Um, so you're looking at you know potentially a complete you know sort of shift in the way that states need to need to view um, the transition that's going to take place and to and to, and to be proactive about that, um, that, that. That's why I think that what we're really needing is a, is a paradigm shift in um, you know in how we approach the thought about our energy future and, and energy planning. But it needs to consider what's going to happen. Um, you know with the with with the early onset of of, of retirements of, of the existing you know, with the existing power plant fleet and, and, how we, and how we take care of that because the issues to local communities are very real. I mean, you know, the, the issues in upstate New York with potential closure of Guinea and Fitzpatrick, the local communities are in a panic right now, um, both because, you know, they've been tied to this plant for so long, but because they have really, they're very real concerns about, about what's going to happen to their tax base, how they're going to pay for their schools, how they're going to pay to have, you know, the roads fixed, snow removal. Um, you know, uh, what's going to happen to local businesses who depend on, uh, you know, the workers of the plant and their very high salaries. 
these are all very, I mean, they, these are problems that can be solved, but they have to be dealt with, pro, you know, proactively. Um, and that's really, I think, where we need to, we need to transition, you know, we need to trans transform decommissioning from this area of tremendous risk um, to an opportunity to create a just transition, um, you know, for nuclear power plant communities to create models for what happens when fossil fuel plants close, um, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that that can happen, um, I think the, the, the agreement that Vermont negotiated with Entergy at, at, um, for, Vermont, for the decommissioning of Vermont Yankee really points a way forward. There are, I mean, a very important things that were included in that. Um, such as, you know, the removal of the, of the spent fuel from the pools into dry cast storage immediately uh, by 2020. Um, that the, the Entergy committed to begin decommissioning within six months of when the decommissioning trust fund was up to the, what the NRC minimum requirement was. Um, and to contribute to $25 million to local economic development uh, funds, to put money into um, a remediation fund for the non-radioactive waste at the site, all of those sorts of things. Um, they've you know, been transferring uh, as many you know, workers from Vermont Yankee to other plants that Entergy operates as a way to sort of mitigate some of the job losses. Um, those things are all important examples of what can be done if the state approaches, um, approaches decommissioning you know, you know, proactively, rather than relying on the NRC's process, but to actually, you know, get contractual commitments from the company as to how decommissioning is going to take place. Um, now, um, there's also been pitfalls. I mean, you know, there were some there were some curveballs in the process of Vermont Yankee that because it's the first reactor to go into that kind of process, um, you know, weren't foreseeable. And so one of those, of course, is uh, that in our, in Entergy has been getting exemptions from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to use the decommissioning trust fund for non-decommissioning expenses. Um, the, you know, what's the, the sort of the, you know, the, the kind of the, the elephant in the room with, with the decommissioning trust funds isn't just that the NRC's estimates for the cost of, of decommissioning are too low, unrealistically low, um, but also that, um, that, the, that, that, that those costs don't include everything that's going to happen when the plant closes. It's only radiological decommissioning and cleanup of the site, not the storage of spent fuel, not property taxes, not emergency planning, uh, not non-radiological uh, toxic cleanup. Um, those are all things that are, that are very real expenses that, that, the, that, these, that the, especially these merchant reactors are going to try to, to use the decommissioning funds for. And this is also, you know, this is also an issue of, of you know, of, of concern for the states in that, uh, you know, when these merchant plants were sold, um, they were given decommissioning trust funds that had been accumulated by the utilities by charging the ratepayers money. And they were built up like a pension fund. So ratepayers pay in to the, you know, the honor utility bill every month. It's invested over time. It's supposed to grow, you know, like a pension fund or the Social Security Trust Fund. Um, when, when Entergy and Exelon and these other companies took over, these, took over the plants, they stopped contributing into the decommissioning funds. So the only way in which these trust funds are, are growing is by investments in the market. There's no principal being contributed anymore. And so essentially, you know, these companies were given ratepayer money, a ratepayer asset, um, that they have, you know, basically, you know, in some ways uh, not manageable or squandered. And, you know, and the states have an interest in making sure that those, that those monies are used for the specific purpose for which they were accumulated. And there's, so it, there's also, I think, ways in which the states can leverage, you know, that authority um, to, uh, to, 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 to make sure that, uh, that, the, that the decommissioning funds are used as wisely as possible. Um, now, I think, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to hit this issue very hard in New York soon uh, with, with the Fitzpatrick and Ganae reactors. And, um, you know, you should watch uh, this week, you'll find a flyer actually on the table and back um, uh, for the Beyond Fitzpatrick campaign, uh, which is being organized by, by the Alliance for Green Economy in, in years, um, to basically, you know, to, to, to try to prevent a bailout of the Fitzpatrick reactor and to push the state to do um, a proactive approach to decommissioning and replacement of Fitzpatrick um, that, would, that would accomplish these things. Thank you. One of the things that Tim just underscored for me is uh, the fact that nuclear is not cheap anymore. Uh, you know, we've been laboring under the, uh, I think, false assumption that nuclear bids in lowest, so they get, they get 
the, in New York State because of um, marginal pricing. Uh, they get the difference between what they bid in and the highest uh, bidder that is needed to meet tomorrow's needs. Uh, but apparently, uh, that's uh, increasingly uh, untrue. That uh, and, and the other thing I wanted to just reinforce is the idea of an exit strategy. And, and I want to commend all of the activists in the room. We've acknowledged some of the organizations. Uh, but there are a lot of us that you know have spent years and years uh, working on trying to close Indian Point and make New York and the Hudson Valley safer and, and supporting other efforts to close um, other nuclear reactors. Um, and uh, we have called for an exit strategy. And I think it's time that, uh, as we're thinking about decommissioning, that we really reach out to the workers at Indian Point and these other facilities and try to work with them to ensure their well-being uh, through this transition. Um, and before we have the pleasure of hearing Paul Galay, um, as, as you know, uh, unfortunately, Dave Lockbaum was unable, from the Union of Concerned Scientists, was unable to attend today. But Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear has agreed to um, show Dave's slides as best he can, with Dave's permission, uh, on the do's and don'ts of decommissioning. All right. So uh, thank you, Manajo, for asking me to do this. And uh, it's an honor to do my best Dave Rockbaum impersonation. I used to have a recurring nightmare in college where I would, be, I would find myself in the middle of a final exam that I was not only unprepared for, but hadn't been notified about until I. <laughs> so the dream is the reality. So, and Alfred Meyer was kind enough to help me advance slides. So do's and don'ts with decommissioning. Don't assume reactors are immortal or assured of operating to the end of their licenses. And already today you've heard about Kalani, Wisconsin, like a boat out of the brew because it couldn't compete with cheaper, unfortunately, fracked natural gas, but also wind power. Dominion decided to just close her up in uh, 2013, and it caught a lot of people by surprise, including the industry. And I think there's a lot of reactors that are in major denial. So here's UCS's, Union of Concerned Scientists map, of 26 closed down reactor sites. And I'm sure you can see some of your favorites up there. Uh, Big Rock Point in Charlottesville, Michigan, way up north there, is one of mine. A lot of decommissioning lessons can be uh, learned from that. You got the Fermi One meltdown in southeast Michigan. And of course, in the northeast, a lot of that's been talked about today. Reactors do close. They will close. There is a, uh, a wave of closures coming. Next slide. Do periodically review plans to retain jobs and offset tax revenue losses when reactors close. And that's been touched on just, just now by Tim and by Deb. And uh, it is fair to say uh, the institutional knowledge of the workforce at the reactors is essential in doing a safe job of this. And uh, as Deb mentioned, the, uh, the rating of the decommissioning fund to pay local taxes is not acceptable. And so again, at a place like Palisades in Michigan, which is an energy reactor, uh, when the sale went down from the previous owner, Consumers Energy, to Entergy Nuclear, a raid of the decommissioning fund took place. In that particular circumstance, it was uh, a total of $316 million raided from the decommissioning fund. $100 million went to Entergy, $100 million went to Consumers Energy, and $100 million was kicked back to the ratepayers of Michigan as some kind of a buy-off blessed by the Public Service Commission, seriously depleting the decommissioning fund. So there's lots of shenanigans being played with these funds. Next slide. Do not present distorted views of the situation. So um, just recently at Palisades, the annual meeting that NRC conducted was attended for the first time in decades by some 300 of the workforce at Palisades. It was kind of a rah-rah pep rally about the future of the plant. And I think that that denial, that, just, that the closures are coming, and the refusal to prepare for that is a real problem. Next slide. So uh, 
Main Yankee has been talked about today. Um, that was I, I didn't know the specifics of the uh, children's summer camp at Main Yankee on this uh, still radiologically contaminated site that's been released for unrestricted reuse. But at Big Rock Point in northern Michigan, which uh, the decommissioning was conducted over a nine-year period from 1997 to 2006, and uh, the plan was to turn that into a state park at Big Rock Point, and it was going to feature a museum glorifying the atomic age. And the part that we could not stomach was the scenario of school buses full of children being bussed in to go to this museum, and a state park on Lake Michigan invites you to swim in the lake, invites you to fish on the shoreline. And the problem with that is, and this is a question I wanted to ask today, there seems to be some kind of magical thinking that the property line ends at a place like Vermont Yankee at the river or at Big Rock Point on the Lake Michigan shoreline. And this just discharge canal at Big Rock Point that's been used for 35 years of radiological discharges into Lake Michigan, uh, they haven't even looked at the sediments in that canal or the sediments of Lake Michigan offshore. They don't know how bad the contamination levels are. So that's what inspired a lot of us to involve ourselves in this proposal for a state park at that site and say, no way. And it's still, uh, it's still a fight that goes on. And they still have not addressed that sediment contamination. Unrestricted reuse. Next slide. All of the spent fuel generated during Maine Yankee's operation over the decades is still at the site, just out of the picture the NRC paints of its decommissioning status. And we can talk more about Maine Yankee during the Q&A, I suppose. One of the proposals for Maine Yankee's irradiated nuclear fuel was to take it by train to Skull Valley Indian Reservation in Utah, west of Salt Lake City, very near to Energy Solutions' so-called low-level radioactive waste dump in the West Utah desert. It did not happen, thankfully, um, and it's a good thing because private fuel storage's uh, plan was to serve as a stepping stone to Yucca Mountain. And so if Yucca was to be canceled, the waste would be returned to sender. So if the waste had ever moved from Maine to Utah, 2,000 miles or more, one way, it would have been returned to sender. Uh, 50 or so containers traveling 5,000 miles round trip, accomplishing absolutely nothing. And those kinds of proposals are still being pushed, uh, centralized interim storage in Congress right now. Next slide. Uh, Yankee Road, Deb has uh, addressed that. Next slide. Nearly all of the spent fuel generated during Yankee Road's operation over the, over the decades is still at the site. And this is true of that slide of 26 reactors. A big rock point, which, by the way, was a very tiny reactor, 70 megawatts electric. It essentially was an experimental reactor for General Electric, and they made a huge mess up there. What they have is an empty field, as at these sites, uh, still radioactively contaminated soil, groundwater, sediments in the surface waters to, to some extent, and the deeper you go, perhaps the worse it is. But what you do have that's visible are the high-level radioactive waste storage containers. And at Big Rock Point, it's only seven. Seven dry casks with irradiated nuclear fuel and one dry cask of greater than Class C low-level radioactive waste, which is radiologically as hazardous as high-level waste. It's reactor internals. Next slide. Adam Neck, Connecticut Yankee. And I think the point that I'd want to make about this, and Doug touched on it, was the, the pool leaks. And this is true of uh, Indian Point as well. And that was mentioned by uh, Mr. Sipos this morning. The pool at Indian Point, multiple pools, have leaked for years and decades. Uh, High-level radioactive waste storage pools. There's a list of some 13 pools in the country that came out in December of 2013 under NRC's Nuclear Waste Confidence Environmental Impact Statement. And there was some news in that chart for me. I'd only known about a half dozen pool leaks up to that point. There are 13 pools in the United States that have confirmed leakage, some of them only on site, self-contained to the nuclear plant, but some of them into the environment, including Indian Point, including Connecticut Yankee, uh, including Vermont Yankee. It wasn't from the pool, it was from pipes under the reactor. But as has been mentioned today, those leaks of, of significant amounts of radioactivity into soil and groundwater and sediments is going to cause the decommissioning price tag to increase dramatically. 
Next slide. All of the spent fuel generated at Connecticut Yankees operation over the decades is still at the site, just out of the picture, the NRC paints of its decommissioning status. And remember, as, as Deb uh, embodies, people live around these sites. So these are security risks. These are ongoing environmental and public health risks. Next slide. Do show that spent fuel remains at allegedly decommissioned plant sites. And uh, one thing we need to be on the alert against, I guess, is uh, Lockbaum's going to talk about pawns on a chessboard in the next slide. These orphan sites, these uh, stranded sites, are being used as a political football on Capitol Hill and by the Department of Energy and others who would like to open centralized interim storage in a great big hurry. They're saying, oh, we have to, you know, allow these sites to be used for productive use again. We have to get the high-level radioactive waste out of there, move it somewhere, like an Indian reservation out west, or an already badly contaminated Department of Energy site like Savannah River site, South Carolina. Or one of the lead candidates is waste control specialists in West Texas, which is right above the Oglala Aquifer. Uh, one thing that just happened recently was with the RIP uh, radiological release to the environment in New Mexico, Los Alamos, in a great big hurry, moved drums with similar contents, if not identical contents, to the drum that breached underground and whip to the waste control specialist site. They're stored in the open air outdoors, and hopefully there won't be any breaches of those barrels at waste control specialists. But they've taken huge risks already and made bad mistakes in their rush. And so... Here it is. Uh, do not use nuclear workers as pawns on the economic chessboard. And that incident at Palisades I just mentioned, where 300 workers were turned out, waited in line to sign in, and I have to wonder which manager at Exelon was in charge of making sure which workers showed up that night for this pep rally that was supposed to be a public meeting about that year's performance at Palisades. The workers are being, you know, threatened with their livelihoods, with their jobs, and. Uh, they, they do have a big role to play in the cleanup, the decommissioning, the dismantlement, and the safeguarding and the management of the high-level radioactive waste. So a just transition. Next slide. What we advocate, this is Union of Concerned Scientists, that operating reactors expedite the transfer of spent fuel to dry storage to minimize the inventory of irradiated fuel stored in the pools and also protect dry cast storage against sabotage. At permanently shut down reactors, uh, complete the transfer from pools to dry storage as soon as practical, closer to six years rather than 60 years, which is allowed by NRC, and protect again dry storage against sabotage. NRC rejected accelerated transfers on the grounds that workers would receive increased doses from those operations. And um, this was another of many battles with the NRC. The chairman, uh, Allison McFarland, actually voted the right way on this one. She called for expedited transfer, but she was outvoted by the other commissioners. And one of the crazy things is that under the nuclear waste confidence uh, fight of recent years, which is now in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and Jeff Fettis is one of the attorneys for the Environmental Coalition, uh, uh, Deputy Attorney General Sipos is also involved in that lawsuit, on behalf of the state. Um, incredibly, in the environmental impact statement by NRC on nuclear waste confidence, they said the pools are safe, the waste can stay in there for up to 60 years post-operational shutdown during the safe store period. And why could they say that when you cornered them on it? They could say that because certainly if there were to be a pool fire, people would be evacuated to a safe location. They would get out of harm's way. On the one hand, NRC says that. On the other hand, as someone mentioned this morning, it has become a rubber stamp by the NRC to grant exemptions to shutdown reactors, like Vermont Yankee, to do away with emergency preparedness. So you can't have it both ways, but NRC does have it both ways. So the pool fire risk is huge, and uh, Citizens Awareness Network, back in 2002, as an alternative to Yucca, as an alternative to shoddy dry cask storage, as an alternative to these pool fire risks, which are worst at the Mark 1s, uh, hosted a conference in Connecticut in 2002 that led to the formation of the hardened on-site storage principles, 
one of the first principles is empty the pools. Get the waste out of these vulnerable pools into a robust dry cask storage configuration. And Dr. Gordon Thompson was commissioned by CAN to do a full-length report on what that would look like. So next slide. Uh, I guess it's coming up. There's an image that shows what hardened on-site storage begins to look like. So here, uh, Dave Rockbaum is pointing out this, uh, you know, dissipation of radioactivity levels, um, reactor decommissioning regulations, uh, 50 years of just sitting on it, and then a 10-year actual decontamination dismantlement uh, undertaking. Next slide. But you'll see that NRC regulations under DECON allow for rapid dismantlement. And in fact, that's what happened at Big Rock Point in Michigan. Everyone was being told safe store for 60 years. There was a public meeting held in January of 1997. Nope, we've changed our mind. We're going to do immediate dismantlement. And they did. They took nine years. They uh, reversed themselves on this position of protecting workers against higher radiation levels. In fact, the company in charge of the Big Rock Point decommissioning, British Nuclear Fuels Limited, which then got absorbed later into Energy Solutions, which is now undertaking the biggest decommissioning in U.S. history at Zion Nuclear Power Plant north of Chicago, two full-size reactors. As we speak, Energy Solutions is in charge of that. At the time of the Big Rock Point decommissioning, as we did more and more research, we found that on, big, on uh, British Nuclear Fuels website, where the, this is their sales website trying to hire themselves out for decommissioning projects, they bragged up that Big Rock Point was the dirtiest decommissioning they'd ever undertaken. And this is the company that was running the Sellafield reprocessing site in Britain. So that was a really scary admission. But the thing was, the workers on the ground in Charlevoix, Michigan, were being told, you're not facing radiological hazard. On the website, they described how they were being very careful with the removal of the, uh, the stacks where the atmospheric releases come out. It was so badly contaminated they couldn't use a typical demolition dismantlement technique because of the radioactive dust cloud that would travel downwind. So they were taking it apart with a crane by sections. The workers were working inside of the stack and had little idea as to how dangerous their, their jobs were. They were being paid well. So there weren't many questions being asked. Next slide. Do not use nuclear workers as pawns on the economic chessboard. And I kind of just touched on that. Next slide. Don't leave spent fuel as attractive targets. So I just happened to uh, be invited by uh, Congressman Tonko of New York, who's on the subcommittee in the US House on, uh, it's called the Environment and the Economy Subcommittee of the US Energy and Commerce Committee talking about uh, nuclear material transportation, just uh, October 1st. And I brought up the issue of a test that was carried out at the US Army Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland in 1998. It was a tow anti-tank missile tested against a German castor cask, which is considered the Cadillac of dry casks. It's 15 inches of die cast iron. That's a pretty thick cask wall compared to US casks, which are much thinner metal than that. And this tow anti-tank missile put a hole through the side of this German cask this big around. It's what the missile system is designed for. It's designed against Soviet T-72 tanks, which are very thickly armored. And what the test showed was that, yes, indeed, dry casks are vulnerable. This is on-site storage, stationary, to such an attack scenario. And wouldn't you know, there are thousands of tow anti-tank missiles available on the black market internationally, unfortunately. And uh, what that test was all about was actually a sales pitch by the cask company that wanted to sell users of its cask technology a flak jacket to put on the outside of the cask that would absorb the attack and leave the cask um, unharmed, except what if they show up with two anti-tank missiles, you know? So um, this is a very real issue, the uh, security vulnerability of dry cask storage in the open air, uh, in plain sight. Next slide. So this is what a typical dry cask storage configuration looks like. If I'm not mistaken, these are Holtec casks, which are in use at Vermont Yankee, for example. These have very bad quality assurance violations for another thing, but they are not designed to withstand terrorist attacks. Next slide. Go ahead. 
Uh, do protect spent fuel within dirt cheap anti-sabotage barriers. So next slide. So a part of, um, and this really is a reflection of Dr. Gordon Thompson's work back in January of 2003, his robust storage report done for CAN, where he had a similar graphic, where if you were to put earthen berms around dry casks and still allow for airflow cooling, which is what they're designed for, you have eliminated line of sight attack. You can't use an anti-tank missile against this anymore. And this has actually been done under public pressure at places like Prairie Island in Minnesota, where the Prairie Island Indian tribe has been fully engaged on trying to protect its community just a few hundred yards away from the dry cast storage at the Prairie Island nuclear power plant. And there is an urban berm surrounding the dry cast storage at Prairie Island. Another place in the country is Palo Verde. And my joke back home in Michigan, where the dry casks are out in the open on the Lake Michigan shoreline, drinking water supply for 40 million people in two countries. Uh, you know, I have an uncle in Kalamazoo, Michigan, who owns a bobcat and would do this job uh, dirt cheap. You know, no nuclear cost escalation factor involved in getting a, ten, you know, a tall enough urban berm to prevent line of sight attack on these things. This is not happening at the vast majority. Next slide. Could you just, this is an example of hardened on-site storage. It's, 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 a, it's a step in the right direction. I it's mean, it's not a okay. full look at a hardened cask. There's a lot of uh, things that need to happen with our hardened on-site storage. You need monitors on the casks, for one thing. You need in-place monitors for radiation levels, heat levels, pressure levels. That's a basic step that needs to be taken that isn't now. When there was an earthquake at... Uh, North Anna Nuclear Power Plant in 2011, August, they had to bring in pressure monitors to see if the casks had retained their inerting heat transfer gases. And that took some time to do. So they need to have in-place monitoring. And, uh, but this, this takes away one attack scenario on these uh, casks. Another example, the Dr. Arjun Makajani, who coined the term hardened on-site storage at the CAN conference, points out is dispersal of the casks on a site, if possible, Vermont Yankee is too small, to make it so that they're not lined up like bowling pins and can all be attacked at the same time. And in fact, in Dr. Thompson's uh, design basis threat, what these things might face and need to defend against, he actually assumed a 10 kiloton nuclear warhead being used against a dry cast storage installation. And you, you'd ask, that seems kind of far-fetched. Well, the ultimate dirty bomb would be a large explosion at a nuclear power plant, especially at a pool, which could liberate all of the radioactivity, at least the cesium-137 in the pool, into the environment. But that could also occur if a nuclear warhead were to be used against concentrated dry cast storage. So the point is to disperse the uh, storage across a site, make it so it's not so clearly visible to attackers. Those are some examples of Haas. Next slide. Don't leave spent fuel unattended and scattered across the country. And again, this is a UCS presentation, and I've already, from my own editorial position, commented on centralized interim storage. Uh, these are dilemmas. And so what centralized interim storage or the Yucca Mountain Dump, which is what that hearing I testified at was about, a Republican congressional attempt to revive the Yucca Mountain Dump, you're going to be launching uh, shipments by road, by rail, by waterway, which are all potential targets too. And so in the interim, a part of hardened on-site storage is as long as it's stuck at these reactor sites, it should be defended better than it is, which is not at all, essentially. And by the way, one of those uh, transport scenarios is water burn by barge, and including from Indian Point down the Hudson River. In fact, there are a bunch of barge shipment proposals in this neck of the woods on Long Island Sound into, uh, I believe it's the Port of Elizabeth from Oyster Creek, if I'm not mistaken. So there's barge shipments, there's rail shipments, there's truck shipments that would um, happen in unprecedented numbers if these bad dump site proposals move forward. Next slide. Uh, these are the 26 shutdown reactor sites. Again, next slide. Do insist the federal government step up and have a proper long-term storage place for spent fuel. I, I think it says disposal on there. That is a federal commitment. Um, in fact, the uh, US government taxpayers are forking out $500 million a year for a breach of contract to the nuclear utilities 
for not taking the garbage out starting in January of 1998. So that's uh, your, your tax dollars at work. Um, we have to be very careful about where the waste would go, of course. So um, these centralized interim storage sites are very risky. Again, they would be surface storage, open air, plain site, but very concentrated. Private fuel storage Utah was going to be 4,000 casks in one place, 40,000 metric tons. And then, of course, Yucca Mountain, there's a NRC public comment phone-in opportunity from 2 to 4 today, underway, I guess. And uh, they're still trying to make the Yucca Mountain dump happen, which would, and NRDC again, Jeff Fettis, won the lawsuit against the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on behalf of a coalition of environmental groups. That was in 2004, where EPA wanted to cut off regulations at Yucca after 10,000 years. Well, EPA was ordered back to the drawing board by the court, and they came out with a million-year hazard associated with high-level waste. So they have to face reality. Next slide. And so here's Dave's modest proposal for a solution. Since it's hardly been used in recent years, perhaps this could be the place for a long-term story. Okay, very good. Um, at this, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to say how important this is that elected officials begin to understand this information. Um, I'm an elected official. I want to acknowledge Kathy Talbot from the city of Peekskill. Are there any other elected officials in the room? Great. Thank you. Thank you. But it will be up to all of us to get this information to our elected officials. And with that, uh, I would like to welcome um, Paul Gallet, the president of Hudson Riverkeeper, who's going to give perspectives on our own nuclear power plant, Indian Point. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, ma'am. If I talk loud and keep the mic close, is it, is it loud enough? Yes. OK, good. Uh, the title of the, of the symposium is Challenges for U.S. Reactor Decommissioning. Well, uh, as someone who's dedicating the biggest chunk of the resources of my organization to closing Indian Point, I'll say that for us the challenge is to get to closure and get to decommissioning and add to the problem that we're discussing today. So it's a little counterintuitive, but we want to put more pressure on the system. And one of the themes, and it's great to go last, because let's face it, everything's been said. And I can give you a bit of an update on Indian Point, and I can talk a little bit more about the point that's been raised by Tim and others as to replacement energy, which I think is such an important question. But when it comes right down to it, the nuclear industry, to, to channel David Lockbaum, the the way the Nuclear Regulatory Commission handles uh, licensing and relicensing for um, plants like Indian Point uh, is like what you'd see if the National Football League decided to move the goalposts on a football field 50 yards closer to, to one another because all the players were 50 years old and had hip replacement surgery and couldn't run that far. So, you know, it's no surprise that we're having trouble with decommissioning because the whole industry is like an industry trying to pass a check that doesn't have sufficient funds, and it's been kiting that check forward for so many years, and now they can't help but start bouncing. And when you think about dry cask, which is thought by us to be uh, a desirable solution, given that our spent fuel pools at Indian Point are triply packed with nothing to do with the fuel. And as uh, my colleague in the audience, Deborah brown Cotto, who's been fighting relicensing for uh, eight or so years uh, and is a hero to me and to all of us, uh, can tell you the pools have leaked, they do leak. The issue of creating more spent fuel and continuing to operate Indian Point is maddening to us. You think about the 40 to 70 fire safety Variances. You think of the issues of metal fatigue, where the uh, even the NRC says, well, we think they're very close to the safety margin on metal fatigue. 
You know, when the NRC is saying something is close to the safety margin, you know it's on the wrong side of the safety margin. The terrorism risk. You know, Department of Defense has uh, had studies within the last two or three years that suggest that Indian Point is especially vulnerable to terrorism risk. The idea that the Algonquin pipeline could get built so close to Indian Point that it would jeopardize the uh, integrity of the plant if there were an explosion. Something that I and some of the folks in the audience have been talking about with congressional uh, delegation folks as recently as four hours ago. Um, evacuation impossibility. Governor Pataki, who was a supporter of Indian Point, commissioned a study 12 years ago, and the conclusion of the study, and he, I'm sure he was hoping it was going to be everything is fine, was that the evacuation plan is a paper plan for a paper emergency that would not protect us in a real-world radiological risk scenario. Uh, more recently, Riverkeeper and NRDC uh, jointly commissioned a study that suggested uh, not only can we close Indian Point quite safely with uh, conservation efficiency, demand side management, and renewables, uh, that if we did not, and there was an accident even on a Fukushima level, you could have as many as 5.6 million people needing to shelter in place or evacuate, a seven-fold cancer uh, risk increase, and a huge swath of land down to the George Washington Bridge that would become uninhabitable. And can you imagine the, the New York metro area after a Fukushima, let alone a uh, uh, a Chernobyl scale accident, and that is why we are working so hard to close Indian Point. Uh, as I understand it, uh, like virtually every other plant, the funds available to decommission uh, Indian Point are vastly insufficient, that the plan is to go as deep into the 60-year safe store, another beautiful Orwellian phrase, safe store uh, uh, phase, between operations and decommissioning to generate more funds to uh, adequately have money on hand to do the decommissioning. Uh, unlike uh, many plants where uh, there is a uh, high proportion of waste being moved to dry cask, there's a very low proportion of waste being moved to dry cask during operations. Uh, and um, that is extremely unfortunate because as, as insufficient as dry cask technology currently is, it is just so much better and so much safer and so much less vulnerable to terrorism uh, than the way the pools are at Indian Point. As a former uh, member of the staff of the Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York State Attorney General's Office, I feel that perhaps I can use a lot of my remaining time uh, talking from the standpoint of someone who, uh, who was, um, outreach was done to me as a regulator. And now I do outreach to regulators and to congresswomen and, and others. And so I would say that what we really need, if we're going to get our fair share in, in necessary funds to be able to do this decommissioning on a broad basis and effectively do it on a broad basis, is that we need to rededicate ourselves to truly effective, truly in-your-face saber rattling for our regulatory agencies and our members of our delegations. You know, it works. The squeaky wheel does get the grease. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I'm sure all of you know this quote, uh, and you probably know who said it from the moment I say, moribund agency, uh, completely captured by the industry it's supposed to regulate. 2007 said by Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Biggest so it hasn't changed. We had two um, chairpersons who tried to make some change, uh, and the system chewed them up and spit them out. Uh, the the moribund, the capture, we have to keep fighting that. We have to keep fighting that through our delegation in Washington, through our officials in Albany. It is an imperfect science. Every 10 hours of effort we put into it may get us 20 minutes of results, but we must. What choice do we have? So many of the issues associated with infrastructure in this state and in this country are, are akin to the situation with decommissioning, are akin to the situation with nuclear power, where we've stopped investing in roads, bridges, 
water treatment infrastructure, water supply infrastructure. The American Society of Civil Engineers has done a study of New York water uh, infrastructure and says we're spending 20 cents for every dollar we need to be spending just to not fall further behind with our plants. And there's, these are not radiological plants. These are water treatment plants and water supply plants. They are very important to us, but even those are falling uh, probably tens of billions of dollars behind over the next 20 years. So we need to push for investment. Attention must be paid, and it will only be paid if our advocacy is at its top level of effectiveness. The last point I'd like to make, so that hopefully we can start Q&A at 2.30, is with regard to where to from here on supply. Uh, we have in New York, according to many articles, one very recently that was uh, published in the um, website Vox, and if you're not on the Vox.com feed, you've got to be, because it's like BuzzFeed for thoughtful people. It gives you the stories. I'm glad none of you knows what BuzzFeed is. That's very, very encouraging about the state of your evolution as, as members of, of an ethical society. BuzzFeed is when they give you um, the 10 celebrities who supposedly smell the worst. And what Vox does is it gives you the 10 articles that are the most thoughtful and the most diverse in giving you perspectives on issues like the, the so-called REV program in New York, which is reforming the energy vision. And again, I wasn't here this morning. Perhaps some of this has been covered. But I've got to say that for all the things you could say about our governor or our legislature, uh, you know, they are being looked to nationwide with this reforming the energy vision for their efforts to boost distributed power for their efforts to boost demand-side management, for their efforts to boost uh, renewing the grid, for their efforts to boost renewables and consumer-based energy efficiency. Uh, and I just wrote to the Public Service Commission to push them to uh, fast-track the uh, community um, aggregation program for uh, concentrated solar when you don't have a good roof yourself but you want to invest in community aggregate solar. Uh, and they have pilots in, in mind for uh, Ulster and, and Westchester, and I'm sure Manna and others can talk about that. But you know, there are a lot of people operating out of uh, fear. And I distinguish that from uh, risk. And I distinguish that from risk assessment, which is what we all do. We're not afraid of nuclear power. We're not afraid of insufficient decontaminate, uh, de uh, decommissioning. We've assessed the risk. And if you are not concerned about something for which the risk is excessive and the probabilities are excessive, then you're not awake. But there are a lot of people in government who operate out of fear. Fear that we won't have enough power. Fear that prices will go up. And that's why a uh, river keeper Clearwater, Scenic Hudson, Natural Resources Defense Council commissioned studies that show that you can close Indian Point with a minimal additional cost, which even the Department of Public Service assesses at um, about $60 per year, maybe $6 per, per month, $72 per year for an average household. You can close Indian Point without a single additional cubic foot of fracked natural gas. The New York Independent System Operator, usually referred to by its acronym NISO, the people who operate the grid, the utilities, uh, not the power generators, but the people who get it into your home, they have completely redone their charts and their graphs of anticipated additional power demand over the next 10 years to go from a line of about 30% increase to a flat line. And that is because New York is pushing initiatives like reforming the energy vision. Uh, Richard Kaufman, who is in charge of this initiative, with Audrey Zeidelman, the, the Public Service Commission chairwoman, uh, recently uh, was interviewed and he said, look, Con Ed thought they were going to need another uh, 
I think it was 500 megawatts, uh, which is a significant amount. It's 25% of, of Indian Point. Uh, and, and we convinced them to, instead of building a new substation or building new transmission capacity, to work the angle of demand side management, to work the angle of consumption more effectively, and then they eliminated the need. They cut 500 megawatts out of need. We need more of that. That will be what we can do to remove the fear of closing places like Indian Point. That will be what we can do to prevent an increase in reliance on natural gas. And that is what we as advocates have to spend every opportunity we can take to do. And if we do a fabulous job, we're going to make some headway. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it to, to you all for the question. Thank you. I don't know if Jeff wants to come up and join the moderation. Go ahead. No, okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, I think you made some really excellent points. And um, at this point, um, I want to just open this up to questions of this panel. And we have other resource people. And with that, um, I'll close, and I hope we can all stay in touch on this issue. And